Okay, um, I'm in the middle of setting something up. I need to re-reference this rig actually because I added a new feature to it. A very, very basic one. Good uh, afternoon or good uh, evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. Okay, so I think if I reference this, the textures are gonna go blank, which will be a little annoying. Oh no, it died. It literally crashed. That is why you're looking at my hypershade window. Well, bummer. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, it's weird because I don't feel any different from like five years ago. I'm just someone who just animates for work and all that stuff. And it's nice that like the internet is such a weird thing where you can put stuff up there and then leave it there and you don't know who's seeing it. And obviously because it stays there forever, your old stuff and your new stuff can all be seen together. And you really just don't know what your outreach is, which I think is very powerful, but then also a little bit scary sometimes. That's why setting a good example of just being a good person uh, is always very important because you don't know who you'd be affecting. It's also one of the reasons why I think like streaming is very cool because you're able to reach out to a lot of people that you otherwise wouldn't be able to, right? All right, actually, let me, before we just like try to fix all this stuff, uh, I'll just explain to you guys what I was doing. So you'll remember from the previous animation that I was working on, I have the hat fly off her head, right? And by default, we can see here that her hat doesn't have a parent. Oh, well, now it has parent space now. Did you see it has a parent space? But that's because I added this. So there was no parent space here. And so basically whenever you move the head, um, the hat will always follow. And sometimes, you know, when you get a rig, you don't have all the spaces, right? Um, and there are probably other tools that you can use to sort of, I think, set this up. But I took a very, very, very basic rigging class a while back, a long time ago, where I learned how to do sort of really, really, really primitive setups for certain things. But yeah, so right now, for example, when this is set at zero, um, you can move the head and then this is obviously going to follow because that's the default nature. But uh, I added this thing where if you hit it to one parent, then when you move the head or move anything else that it's supposed to be parented to normally, it doesn't move which is perfectly good for our needs where the hat is not part of her animated behavior where it's just acting independent. And when it's acting independent, then it just does nothing. So it's just easier to work with because then when you want to animate the girl and not the hat, then they don't affect each other, right? That's just a workflow thing. Do you guys want me to quickly go over how I set that up? Okay, yeah, I can briefly, briefly go over. It's very, very simple. I will use, so I'm gonna save this and then we will do a test version. So this is the general state of the rig when you get it first. Uh, right now, we're just gonna quickly go over how to add a parent space to something if you have something that does not exist. And in this case, we have this hat, as we have mentioned, where it is attached to her head by default because most hats usually are worn on your head. And what we wanna do is we have an animation where the hat is flying by itself in the wind. When it's out here and she's not in the frame, we don't want us animating her to affect this, the hat. The, the funny thing about 3D animation, I feel like a lot of times is when you have a rig and the rig doesn't serve how you want to animate, right? In, in the case of 2D drawing, when you want to draw something, you're just like, I'm going to draw it and you just draw it. The limitation for 2D animating is, can you draw it? And if you can, great. If you can't, then good luck. I'm not a rigger, so I don't know what the best way of doing this is, but I have a method that I have learned that is decent enough. It doesn't incorporate any matching or anything, but for our purposes, we're just going to be like beginner noob students and just try our best. Hi Panic asks, I had a question. How long have you been animating for? Uh, I've been animating professionally for about five, almost six years. And all of those have been at Riot, working on League of Legends for skins. Skins for League of Legends. I have, I was studying a couple years prior to that where I took classes at Anim School, Animation Mentor, uh, Animation Collaborative, and stuff like that, so. Uh, what is in the menu next to the model? Oh, the panel. This thing? It's basically the same thing as these things that you, for example, this head control that you can select through the head. This is just something that the rigger creates so that it's easier for you to like, animate stuff that you want like the eyebrows so like for example eyebrows here go up and down they're just extra controls that are not on the face so it's a little bit easier to hit 
So for example, if you're out here, you can just select these things. One thing that you can also do is you can create a, a camera that's parented to this to look straight at it in a, in a different window. So basically it's like a mini picker uh, and this is provided by the rig. Whoever designed the rig des decided to sometimes you can put these controls on the side. So for your convenience, like I, I guess the thing is that for riggers, they a lot of their goals are to create something that is easier to animate with for a 3D animator. And I think that's like the thing about this kind of discipline, which is just like 3D animation really relies on fidelity of rigs in order to make your life easier. In the situations where it's not, you just have to elbow through it. But that is, you know, part of the relationship that you have in 3D stuff. You have a modeler that makes the model, which is like how you draw. The rigger is the one that makes it so that you can actually do your job and et cetera, et cetera. And then your job is just to make it move, right? So right rigs are, they're good. They're fun. Are they top of the line? Yeah, in, in, in different ways, in different ways. We It's the thing that with when you're developing games and all that stuff, you work with problem sets. You have limitations and you have scope and you have lots of different things you have to take into account. It is obviously everyone's dream to work with stuff that they do at Pixar and etc. If you guys haven't seen some of their videos and whatnot, you know what? Let's just, for the hell of it, we're going to watch a YouTube video on stream. Okay, we're going to watch two videos. One is rigging and one is for animation. These are all really, really short, but it's very, very cool. So this is a video that Pixar has uh, released and it's a cool thing because it's, a, I think on Disney Plus, they're gonna release this web series called Inside Pixar, which is basically just gonna explain to you sort of like the process of that, that they work through and stuff in terms of like rigging, stories, editing, foundation stuff how they come up with everything create the creative process and whatnot so if you have disney plus take a look at it if you visit their um youtube youtube you'll see small snippets but there are two videos that i i saw that were really really dope one is the rigging one and one is acting animation and you'll notice a couple clips that we see where their their rigs have a lot of automated behavior which is really cool because if, if you think about it for ik when you're animating in 3d a lot of rigs basic ones don't have automatic behavior where you have to do three steps in order to make something that normally looks nice in real life to work that way. And that's part of, you know, the challenge that we learn as we're animating in the beginning because you're not given all these tools. But in the industry where you have a lot of money and a lot of really cool tech artists and people who are very good at programming and a lot of different things you can get in with computers that are more powerful and stuff, you're able to have a lot more automation that takes care of things for you. Now, obviously, uh, you want to be able to have control over this where it doesn't limit you per se, where you can choose to use it when you need to and not use it. Because ultimately, we're just artists, right? We want to creatively or artistically explore or express something. But yeah, let's look at the rigging video. It's really cool. So by the time we're finished with modeling, we have really just the form of the character, but it can't move yet. And the next stage is to give it the ability to move. And that's the process that we call rigging. So rigging is when we take our digital puppet and we connect a bunch of strings to him. Those strings allow us to control his various appendages, like his arms or his elbows. In the same way, we'll take that wireframe mesh, put a bunch of joints inside of it, and associate what parts of the model should move with those joints. Pinocchio here does a lot with six strings. Our characters have on the order of thousands. All right, we're going to try to make a moonwalk. No, they're kind of... Not uh, good enough. <laughs> For me, the coolest part of making the puppets that we create at Pixar are the moments where you see it coming to life for the first time. Watch it. So there's a couple of things that were really cool. Well, first off, the explanation here is really nice where they're talking about puppets. And obviously that's kind of like what we do. Um, but there's also like, do you guys see how this is an IK system and you just grab the hand here? But the shoulder and the elbow are automatically reacting to what you're doing with the hand. And do you see how the hand also, when you're just translating it, it's pivoting to maintain the the behavior that your arm, for example, I, I don't have webcam on, but if you guys all look at your own arm, right? Your hand and your palm, when you're reaching around, your palm and the part of your underside of your forearm are usually always going to face each other, right? They're always going to be in the same plane. Now, the only time it's not is when you rotate your wrist. Your forearm is made of two bones, right? In real life, though, when you're twisting, it's twisting along your forearm. Your forearm is twitching, not your wrist and not your elbow. Your wrist is can only rotate in like 360, right? But the 180 flip that you get is from your forearm doing this like 
two bar twist. Now, the thing is that the biggest thing for IK arms, as we know, right, when we are working with something like this, uh, you grab the arm, you pull up. Do you see how this will always point to this vector point, and then this will always point at the old location where it was pointing earlier, like your hand? It won't dynamically do this where this is the most natural pose if you were to raise your arm if you were to raise your arm right now all three parts of your arm follow each other in the natural motion right and just that's because biologically we're structured in a way that we have to function i don't know in this behavior right so the thing is in 3d we don't get that for free now when you look at this video he's just translating it he's not doing any rotation on that on that hand but it's behaving like a normal arm automatically without you without you having to do anything to it um and obviously you can tell here that they're using they're using their own internal pixar animation thing uh but yeah the thing is like it just works oh so cool anyway then there's all this cool stuff that like they're doing compressions which in video games for at least league we don't really have this fidelity um you'll notice that like the vert count the plane count that they have on all their models like here and here it's so freaking many oh my god his face his face has more polys than like just like one character that we use at one league so this is one of those things where it's like oh it would be so nice to work with this kind of stuff but again if we're talking about are the rigs at riot cool yeah they're cool they're great for what we do and you know every single company has different products that they work on they have different tools that they have they have different pro uh, like project specs right so you can't, uh, are there cooler stuff and better stuff out there? Probably, but it's one of those things where, where you work and what you do, you just got to take what you have, right? Um, yeah, Pixar is like the best of the best. Uh, let's look at this animation one. For me, when I go into my planning, much of it is like getting inside the character's head. The sequence that I'm about to shoot reference for is called Suit. It's when Joe has to go to his mother's shop. <gasps> Joey! What is that? Joey! What has gotten into you, boy? I am acting out four characters. As I'm acting out this performance, I'm trying to get at the heart of the performance. I'm trying to really get those gestures and like that thinking process and all the nuances that really sells this performance in this moment. Oh! If you guys have it, you guys have to watch this one. This one here. Well, watch all of them. But this one, uh, we did this stream. We did a thing earlier. We did a stream a long back, while back ago where we were looking at all these characters here from Soul and how, like, these lines and stuff and how they animated. Like, it's just first off, watching this stuff is crazy. Um, like, how they animate and the rig. If you ever guys, like, watch this film, the, I so baffled by how they did this like technically they go a little bit into detail in this second episode about how the idea came about and just it's it's really cool it's really really cool all right that was a slight tangent so the way that we're going to do this is what you need to do is you need to have something that you can reference your control to that is in world okay let's do blocks so by nature, we want this hat to follow this head, which in this situation, if we just parent it to the head, it follows, right? Ta-da, you have a hat that follows the head. So now the problem is you want this to be able to be out here without this impacting it, right? So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to add a constraint that you can turn on and off. As we know, for example, when you parent something to something, it's stuck. In the outliner, you can tell here that P cube three, which we can call hat, is gonna be attached to head. So the hat will always follow the head, and that's just how it works. There's no way to unparent, well, to temporarily unparent, it just, you are unparenting like that, and then now they're not connected. So what we need to do is we want this to be world, and you don't have to name it world, it's just we're gonna use it as a reference point. And you want basically the option for this hat to follow either the head or this world control. Well, it's, I'm using as a geo thing, right? So I'm using this as a geo thing just to, just to illustrate. The idea here is that this is world. So what we need to do is we need a constraint. What we're gonna do is we're gonna select the world, which is the first thing you want to constrain to, and the thing that you want to be constrained. Remember that when you're parenting, it's always supposed to be the child, then the parent, and then you parent it. 
constraints are reversed. So you take the thing that's going to constrain and the thing that will then be constrained and you do it in that order. So we come up here to constrain. And if you guys are familiar, there's different kinds of constraints you can do. So we're just going to do something called a parent constraint. You don't need to do, change anything as long as you have things by default. But if you have maintain offset, might as well check that box inside the, inside the menu. But otherwise, all you got to do is just hit constraint up here, parent constraint. And you'll notice that this now has blue keys or blue, blue, blue handles here. And the blue handles here basically mean that these values are now constrained to this object. So now, even though the hat is now under the parent head, world will impact it because it is constrained to that. Constraints basically just override parent behavior. Now we have this option where if you select the constraint down here, you can turn it on and off. So one means on, zero means off. When it's one, it follows world. When the constraint is turned off, it doesn't follow and now follows ahead. That is the basic behavior we're looking for. Now, the question here is how do we get it so that we don't have to go into the outline and select everything? The one thing that I will also want to clarify here is that you'll notice that when you select this and now these are all keyed, now when you key it, you can't, you can't key on top of this because these are, the constraint is king of everything, right? So you can unfortunately not key any of this stuff after you've constrained it. So the easiest thing that we can do is we constrain something on a different level, right? So this is the hat and this is the geo, but because we're going to be keying the, the control or the geo or something in the animation, what you're going to want to do if we undo everything, uh, we're going to group the hat. So if you're selecting the hat, you just hit control G, create another uh, thing under it. Now we have a group here. And so what we can do, we can call this hat parent or we hat parent or we just call it hat constraint or we'll just do hat space let's just do hat space so we can see here that basically what we did is we created the head which is here and the hat but now the hat is housed under hat space thank you let's just call it that hat offset is actually probably a more technical term or just it's much more clean in terms of like rigging half offset makes a lot of sense so the hat offset houses the hat so what we can do then is we actually can just constrain the hat offset therefore what is inside the hat offset, which is the actual hat, can be done, can be moved and keyed freely, right? Um, all right, so what we'll do then is we're gonna select the thing we want to constrain to. We're going to select here in the outliner, the uh, hat offset group, and then we're just gonna parent constrain that. So now you'll notice that this constraint that we have created is now part of hat offset, which we can just leave as, and now the hat, as we want to animate, can be keyed, right? Cool. So now the thing is that when we control the hat, we want to be able to sort of toggle this on and off. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit edit, add attribute. So when we hit edit and then add attribute, you get this window over here. And this window uh, basically lets you add something as an attribute. So you can say, for example, parent. Let's call it parent. We're going to do a float. We're going to do a minimum of zero, a maximum of one. And by default, we want it to be turned off because basically with zero in terms of Boolean is false. And then one is true, but we're going to default to zero because by normal behavior, we want the whole rig to function as is, and we don't want the parent space to turn on by itself or by default. Now we click add. So you notice on the right side, it has added this parent space, which we can turn on and off. Now, the only problem is right now, uh, it doesn't do anything because it's not connected. What we're gonna do is we're now gonna connect it and we're gonna hit edit. We're gonna do connection editor. Connection editor is here. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to, to connect attributes together so that they influence each other. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, I want this hat control, this hat attribute called parent to impact this parent constraint on this value to turn on and off. What we're going to do with this connection editor is we're going to load the hat on the left. We're going to load the parent constraint on the right. We're going to select parent and then this world. Do you see that it added this yellow thing here? So what this usually means now is that this value on this uh, world constraint that it has we created is going to mimic the value here. So if it's one, this constraint will show a one. And then if it's zero, 
constraint will be zero. And remember that when we were testing the constraint, this is how you turn on and off. So when the constraint is on, it is going to follow. It's going to follow world. When the constraint is off, it will not follow and it'll follow the head. Make sense? It's a very, very simple thing. Uh, and since this is a very, very just zero one thing, don't have to do anything crazy. Obviously, if you have a more advanced rig where you have tons of different parent spaces and you want them to all to be in the same one, you're going to have to do a lot more planning and a lot more just figuring things out. But if you just need like the normal behavior and then a world space, very, very easy. Um, I think my explanation here might have taken a little bit longer, but essentially that's what I did with, with Ystra uh, for the hat. And I'm just trying to get it so that I can maybe... Uh, let's actually just do this quickly one more time with the actual character. So we are going to select the hat. We're going to take the hat. We're going to group it under its own thing. And what we're going to do is we can call it hat offset. Now, in this case, probably what we should do is we should call it like group biped 001 hat offset or something because naming conventions are pretty, pretty important. Uh, and I guess in this situation, we can rename it. But uh, we'll just call it like bip 001 hat offset. Um, but now we don't have to impact the behavior of this control because this control is what we interface directly with, right? Uh, so we created the hat offset. Now, in terms of what we would constrain to, I just constrained it to this control on the bottom, which is the world node um, for the whole character. So in the situation where you want the whole character to move, then this will still follow it. This is not true world space because true world space is the, the scene. So if I wanted to move everything over, if it was in true world, it would stick in world for the scene. But I think for my purposes for this kind of character, we don't have to go too too crazy, so we don't need to build anything extra. What we're just gonna use, we're just gonna use what we have available to us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna constrain this offset group to this world node or node this world control. Uh, select this control, select the offset group, and then we're gonna hit here, constrain, constrain parent. Plop. It has added the constraint here, and here's the one off and on and Now we're gonna go back to the hat. It up. We're going to go edit, add attribute, parent. You're going to go zero, one for minimum, maximum. And we're going to default to zero because we wanted to be default off. Hit OK. It adds it over here. Now we're going to connect it. So we go to edit, connection, editor. We're going to load the hat on the left. We're going to load the parent constraint on the right. Uh, this reload left, reload right just basically says put what I've selected into this column or this column. Uh, as we know, we cannot select two things at once to show two, two values here all the time. It's a little bit annoying. So select the first thing that you want, load to the left, select the thing that you want on the right to be impacted. You could do this in reverse order if you wanted to, but you know, uh, we are doing the hat control first. And then this, all you want to make sure is that your parents, your new attribute that you created here is visible and that your thing that you want to affect is visible on here. Because what you have to do is you just have to select the thing that will influence for the thing that you control and then the thing that is being controlled. And you select that second and then you'll get this effect. So now in the hat, we have a parent space, turn it on. You can see that here, it turns on to one in the constraint. So now when you move the head, it doesn't follow the hat. Actually, it's funny because I can do it really fast now, but I spent about 30 minutes before the stream trying to figure out how to do this because I didn't remember how to do it. So, you know, got to brush up on your on your knowledge sometimes. But all right, perfect. Um, give me a second as I switch back to my more comfortable screen. For the blocking in the step mode, I am currently definitely in step mode. Uh, everyone has a different way of working. I used to actually animate in layered mode when I first started animating, because that's what my teachers taught me. Got to Riot, I had to change that because the way we work at Riot is very focused on storytelling and poses. So that is now my current work, work style. It's not to say necessarily that's a bad or good thing, but. Uh, how hard was it for me to switch over to stepped? Uh, it wasn't too hard. I was still a very beginner animator, so I wasn't really set in my ways at, the, at that point. I had only been animating for a year or two. It, it was something that like I had not focused on posing a lot 
um so my poses were actually very bad and actually even now i think poses are probably one of my weakest aspects of animating i feel like for me my best sensibilities come from staging and from like the overall motion and like things flowing nicely i think for me has always been my strength that could mainly be because i learned how to animate via layered in the beginning so i'm not sure definitely for me posing has been very weak and appeal is something I'm still working on. There's a lot of people, for example, there's a lot of stuff, for example, for that, a lot of other animators at Riot do very, very well. A lot of them are very good at posing. A lot of them are very good for doing exaggeration. And sometimes I wish I could push to that level, but it's all uh, taste and style. So you wish you could have seen my blocking phase. Oh, for what? You mean for like this animation? Is this one, anyone can see it, it's fine. Like there really isn't, uh, this is pretty basic for now. Uh, one thing we're going to do here, actually, I think for now, um, I'm going to try to do this thing that's very basic and I'm going to just do it slowly, step by step. But if you guys have tools for this, it's usually very easy uh, to work with. Um, it makes the process a lot faster. But what we're going to do is we're going to create, we're going to go to create menu or we're going to create a locator. And so here's a locator. Ta -da! And what we're going to do with this locator is we're going to attach it to this control. Because the problem that we're facing right now, I'm just gonna key on all these keys first, is that this hat is still in this position. And it, if we turn it on and off, it's going to always be like this, right? It's always going to, if we want, we want to convert this into the behavior of in world space, if with these same values in a different space, it's gonna be in a different location. So what we're gonna actually do is we're going to have to use a proxy to transfer values over and get it lined up. If any of you guys can find a tool online that is an align tool, which basically says this control or this thing and this object, make sure that they are put together on the same alignment, regardless of their values, so that they're in the same location in terms of world space. Then you can transfer values from one control to another control to a third control. That way you can bake things out into the space that you need. I believe Anim Tools has an align tool if we look for it, but I'm going to be using a thing that we have at work, which is just the same thing. It's just one that I'm very used to using. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this hat. I'm going to take the locator I want. I'm going to hit the align button. And now the locator is aligned to uh, the hat. Okay. So I'm going to do this on all of these keys in the beginning. Cause I want to make sure I save the position of this hat. So I'm clicking the period button to key forward. Uh, on all the keyframes. And we're just going to make sure that this locator is basically following the hat, at least up to this point. I think up to about here on frame 48, we can probably skip it. And everything else is going to be inside the space of the hat. Now we're going to take the hat here and we are going to convert out. And then we're going to take all these parents and turn them on. Perfect. Up till 48. So you'll notice that now the hat is completely in the wrong position. And that's fine because this controller or this locator created has the behavior that we had in the, in the old animation, right? So now we're just going to do the reverse. We're going to take the hat and then the act locator and then we're just going to bring the hat back we're going to do the opposite sorry bloop, bloop, bloop. cool now one thing to note is that when we hit to when we get to frame 48 there's going to be blending here that's going to be a problem right we're going to have to figure out how to do solving of this blending um and that's going to be have to be like a done over a frame switch later i think for now I think for now we can ignore that because we're not going to spline yet. We'll have to look at that a little bit later. And I think this, this thing we can probably delete. So now this hat, which normally follows the head, it doesn't. Isn't that amazing? Now we can animate this girl and this hat separately because they're not supposed to be linked until they're linked here. And that's that. So now one thing I want to do is what we're going to do is we're going to start adding more key poses because if we were to take everything, actually, let's just do this because it's funny. I'm going to hit all controls and I'm going to spline everything. 
And this is a good test that you can do if you really want. I'm going to spline everything and we're going to look at what it looks like when it's all splined at this current state in time. Because this is one way to test sort of like, are you ready to spline and work from there? And if not, then it's uh, pretty important you keep working until you get it. Okay, honestly, I'm kind of impressed. That doesn't look like shit. It is okay. It has a little bit of like variance in timing and texture so that it feels like it can it can work. Um, and nothing is wigging out too hard, right? The hat's a little bit funky, but I think overall, like the blocking has been pretty clean thus far. And so the motion overall is actually not that bad. If I was in a big rush, I would actually take this and I could probably just start splining a little bit now. I think there's still a couple things that we can do here that we can like optimize so that it looks a little bit better. Obviously, for example, this freeze frame here probably needs to be a little bit, uh, needs to be massaged a little bit more. The solving of here is a bit too tweeny. There's a lot of soft spot stuff here, soft stuff with the legs that we can fix. Uh, we can exaggerate this kind of thing more a little bit, keep it tighter. This come up, this going up probably needs a little bit more of an acting part, or a breakdown. It's a little bit too, too linear. And I think maybe here, on these legs we need to fix these arms we can probably also bake in a better pose you can tell here that her body and her head really aren't doing anything so we need to add something to give them more appeal and then again the hat the hat in terms of it's like acting when it like flies this way and it's spinning i think the thing is you can tell overall the motion has a little bit of like momentum to it and texture right she goes like up readable pose comes down compress has for reach good read pause in the air goes loop up loop down loop up fall down so i think overall it just like works together pretty well pretty decent you can just convert everything into spline to see if it looks good or not and then make your decisions on whether you're ready to move because the biggest issue i think for a lot of animators is the transition from blocking to spline that is usually always very very nerve-wracking and sometimes people are always a little bit concerned about like exactly what are they gonna how do they approach it? How do they change it? What do they need to do to make sure that they feel comfortable? All right, so let's do what we're talking about. So I think for here, we can start talking about how we want stuff to feel. Because right now, when we're doing blocking plus, we want to make sure that we're sort of prioritizing cleanliness. Because the big thing that you waste a lot of time on when you're animating from block to spline is taking too many controls and then changing everything about them every single frame. So you get a lot of this noise. One of the things about cleanliness in animation is you want to make sure you do things with intention. That means basically cleanliness comes from a couple of things. One, you want to make sure that you're animating your controls intentionally. One thing that a lot of people do, for example, is stuff that fights each other. So if we're to look at like this, this, uh, this graph, you can see that already by default, that if you were to spline this and it has curves, it looks nice, right? So one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to have something where it's like this when you want the curve to be like smooth. Because what this means if you're selecting a curve and you're trying to spline it is go up and down and you'll have probably another control that's countering. A lot of times this can happen with hair among other things, but if you were to just take a chain and you have something that's like rotated up and you want it to be straight, but you have the other thing rotated down so that it stays straight. A lot of times, sometimes just to get a look like it's straight, you move two things at once instead of making sure you don't touch it at all. And a lot of times if you have that kind of noise, it'll then make everything f wobbly when you spline it because Maya is going to be doing all this computer stuff to make everything look computery. And in this situation, what you'd want to do is just to make it simple and straightforward. And what you want to do when you're posing and stuff is make sure you select as little, as few controls as possible when you're doing stuff, or at least in the way that you understand sort of like what impacts what. For example, if you're going to pose out the arms, you always want to pose out these clavicles first and then the arm after. Because in an FK situation where the arm is parented to this clavicle, if you put this arm here and then you're animating this one with just the arm and this one with the clavicle, then you're, the problem is you're like, you're putting keys and information on two different things that are not related to each other. And then when you actually spline it, you're going to have to make sure you remember all of that on every single control you put in. And if you haven't done it in a way that is like neither one axis or maybe just two axes, then in the end, everything's going to be fighting with each other. And this is one thing that you'll run into, for example, for gimballing and for your Euler filtering, Euler rotations, which is where sometimes like this, for example, you'll have rotation Z and rotation X that are almost aligned. And anytime their rotation 
uh, has to happen, you'll notice here that these are fighting each other. Like this here is very bad. You don't want this kind of thing to happen. You don't want a smooth thing here and then an unsmooth thing here because this red one is compensating for other things that are happening with this plus the rotation here. This here you can see is a very, very bad one. It's a very bad example. This is something you don't have to, I'm gonna have to clean up, but I'm gonna have to clean up after I make sure that I've cleaned up the things above it. And in this case, that would mean that I've cleaned up the clavicle. So I have to make sure the clavicle is clean. And fortunately, my clavicle is like nothing. So that's fine. So that means then I can go ahead and take this arm and I can clean it in the graph editor, supposedly. And some things you can do if you see like this kind of smooth thing, what you can do sometimes is just delete that frame. Because a lot of times if you're going through like this and you want to like sort of get rid of that kind of like weird rotation on everything, sometimes the computer when you're just posing will figure something out that it thinks that you want. When you have much more information data, in your curve already, then sometimes you just delete it and just rehe it because what what is in between the values that you've already put down serve as a clean key. Yep, starting from the inside and go outwards. That is definitely the best way to go. So that's why a lot of people talk about going with the root first. Um, that is because everything is connected to the root. And if you start with something that's very clean, everything that follows will be cleaner. Guys, this stream makes me talk way more than I ever talk at work. My mouth is gonna... My mouth and throat are so dry. Okay, let's come back here. Let us start from the beginning. One good thing to do is sometimes if you're going to be polishing your blocking stuff, you want to focus on the beginning and just slowly go through it. So for now, this, 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 we're going to take you and we're going to make you look more similar to, to this. But we're going to need to grab you out, pull you back. Okay, so right here, you'll notice that I have this and then I have a down pose. I think what I need to do here is I need to author something a little bit different. I need to change this pose, but we do need a more contact here, I think. This one, we just need to change the passing pose a little bit. Get her to... I wonder if I need to convert this to IK because I've been working with IK on the rest of it. Oh, uh, let me think. Oh God, the head doesn't have... Oh, the neck has world? Please, 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 please. Guys, where's the, where's the neck control? All right, guys, we're just gonna do it now. Uh, we're gonna have, we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna have to move it all over to world now because I don't know, I do not like working in parent. Oh, uh, but then we lose all the stuff. How do I? I'm trying to think of a way to retain all of my, my rotations here. My brain right now can't think of anything else. So I'm just gonna probably do the same thing. <sighs> we're making so much less progress than last week, but that's okay. Hello, locator. Welcome back. You are going to come over to my head here and actually no, you have to come to my neck because the neck is the important part. And then can I get you parented to the control under it? So if we select this space, I parent you to that space. Temp, temp, block. And then let's just double check to see if, I can, if this works. If I take the control, I move you, but I do this and I hit a line. Perfect, I'll take that. We're going to take you now. We're gonna convert you into world space. And then now we take you, take you, and then we'll align you to this. Okay, perfect. We do the neck. We actually take you out again and put you onto spine, spine. Then we select you, then select you. We select you, turn you back off to world, online, on, and then we do this, this, Align, align, perfect. Okay. Bumbo jumbo. We're fixing her head, guys. Yay. Now we're in world space. So if I move her chest, her head should stay flat. Cool. 
See, at work, we would have we have a button that lets us do this, which saves time. Can't have everything, especially when you're not working for work, so. Let us look at this again. She's coming down here. We're gonna wanna make a pose, a passing pose where it feels like she's more, she's more, more on top. And then we probably want her to, I think I want her to actually, Where's the IK? Does it turn to IK? How quickly do I turn you to IK? Hmm. For the sake of this, we might actually turn you into IK all around. Oh, I'm already not liking this. Fuck. Hmm. I don't... There's some times where I think this is great, and then sometimes I'm like, I don't... This is not good. Hmm, we're gonna have to do a little bit of research on this because the thing is I already animated I made some of the stuff in in IK already And I feel like I'm gonna get fricked over because like this pose here. I couldn't replicate in FK All right guys, so we're gonna do the opposite because I, I yeah, IK IK I really don't understand how to handle so at least for these poses This is all IK though, so We'll look at you later. We're not there yet. Up to frame 44. Okay, then let's get her a more natural pose. If this is the root, then we're gonna have to offset you. Isolate hip, 100%. Everything won. Boom. Do I translate on this? Yes, perfect. Isolate hip. So for you, we're going to straighten a bit. And then compress you. And then we're going to want... What kind of pose does someone want to do with this? Probably we bring in her elbows, right? Hmm. I need a cuter pose reference. Cute pose reference! There's my clavicle. I couldn't find my clavicle. Oh, I wish there was translate on this. Rah. Bring in the elbows. The hands can come... Might as well pose the hand a little bit here. Half open, half closed claw with the tips wrapped. Okay, I'm gonna need this to be a zero and this is zero and I'm gonna need this to be here. Strike around here. I'm gonna need this foot to roll up on catch and this foot too all right next thing too we're going to figure out is whether hair can also go no guys the hair doesn't have a world space no how come the most animators have their time sliders so tall? Um, I have it tall just because it's easier to see. Easier to see, easier to click, and just looks nicer. I think it looks way worse when it's just so tiny. Graphically for me, it feels more balanced. I think we can exaggerate here a little bit more. I feel like this down is so short. Is there a difference? Do you guys see a difference here? It's, it's literally a one frame difference and maybe the frame rate on stream will not like be as good, but the jump here She goes into this really quickly and comes out of it really quickly. You can see it's all spaced out in twos, right? But I'm gonna take this stretch pose and delay it So it reads for only one po one frame and not two and then this down pose reads for an extra frame Does that feel any different to you guys? It might, it might be very subtle, but for me, I, I get the sense that this reads a little bit longer and then this transition, the stretch frame, is more of, more of a motion thing. And I like it more. The only problem here is that you just have to remember that when you're when you're framing through this and then you're gonna do this later in my, when you spline, I actually prefer doing this and I'm gonna key on 16 too. And then I'm gonna actually tween very briefly and uh, 75% here. So that 
this kind of transition on the low point is locked as it tr transitions out. So she comes in here at frame 12, but we'll probably need something here on frame 10. So let's just tween 50 and see where she is. Okay, she's running in, perfect. So we will want to author some sort of Na, da, na, da, da, da. Hmm. Okay, I'm actually gonna be a little bit facetious here. I'm gonna actually really, I think in my head, I don't, this action here on this left part happens so fast that I don't understand what I'm gonna be doing for the hand transition. So I'm gonna actually, because this motion is actually quite quite specific i really want to off i really kind of want to make sure that frames eight frames eight through 25 are really specific so this is not necessarily the fastest way of doing it but i might just keep pose on every frame here Okay, guys, we're gonna do another baking pass on the arms. Oh, man. Line the locator. Find the clavicle space. Parent it to the clavicle space. Uh, is that what we want? Oh, I have to bake it on all of them too then. I guess that's right. So I'm gonna have to do all these keys here. All right, then we take local world space and we turn you on because we all like world space. And now on this arm, we can see it's not aligned, but no biggie. And then we'll do this one more time on this. What do we do when we're burnt out animating? That's a good question. Uh, there's different things for that. There's like, why are you burnt out? Um, you can answer that question by being like, is it is it animating specifically or the content you're doing? Because if it's the content you're doing, you can always switch the content, right? I mean, if you're working and you have a deadline and you have to finish it, that's just work. And that's just, you have to, you have to just focus it, at least get through it. Um, but burnout, one of the main causes for it is just doing it for too long without stopping and not taking a break. Everything in balance, right? Obviously everyone also has different amount of patience, different amounts of the of ability to animate for long periods of time and continuously. And even if we all really love doing it, if you do something that you love for too long, too much, it's really gonna bite you in the butt. So the best thing to do is really just take a break. Find something else to do that if, if it's not related to animation, then even better. But really your brain just needs a break. Uh, a lot of times when you experience new things or experience things that are not related to what you do, it ends up being much more engaging and revitalizing. So you'll find a lot more energy. This is also why a lot of people take breaks to walk outside because being at a computer all day contributes to this kind of lifestyle that isn't healthy. So the more that you can sort of set up a structure or a lifestyle that works to your benefit, it's probably the best thing to do. Okay guys, I'm gonna spend the next nine minutes just really, really uh, finishing this retargeting on the space here and then and then I'm gonna play Clash for some friends because they're all waiting already. <laughs> they're being nice and letting me finish the stream. Uh, I need to take the arm now. The arm can be now converted into world space, I think. Then we take the arm again. 
locate are gone. All of our arms are now in world space. So whenever we take body, they'll always face that way. Perfect. Most of the time I feel like I don't animate enough, but I feel burned out at the same time. No, dude, you need to, here, here's the thing. Don't animate enough. That is a bad measure because that is a self, that is a negative feedback loop on your own self where you're not listening to like your own body, right? Not animating enough is is probably mainly because you feel like you see other people's work and you're like, oh, it's not good enough, right? Or you see other people like you maybe progressing faster. I highly recommend not thinking about that because everyone is different. Everyone's speed, everyone's pro like rate of progress when they learn is very different. Everyone has different ways of learning. So in some situations where you are in your life, you may not be learning the, as quickly or as like efficiently as you want. But the point here is as, as long as you're putting in the time you need and you are improving, then that's really all that matters. Cause it's, think about this from a long con perspective. If you burn out now, if you're running a race and it's a marathon and you run so fast in the beginning to keep up with people, but you just, lose you lose your tank you, you run out of the energy in your tank or you just have no gas left and you just like can't finish the race it's important to finish the race you need to get to the end and you're not comparing yourself to other people granted in the job market and you want you want to you know make a living and all this stuff there there is the reality part where you are competing against other people so if you're not up to snuff then you may not pass the test but at the same time if you're not going to pass the test it's not fit for you both both ways think of it as a relationship thing it's like you're not a good fit for either or you either you're not ready or their job just doesn't fit you and it would be better for you to just focus on yourself in the way that like things you can improve on things that you're strong at and just work yourself from that perspective right i'm speaking from this because because for me i relate to that perspective more in terms of relationships <laughs> where there's so much you can stress about about what you can do better, how you can change things to meet a certain standard. But that in a way, in most cases, if you don't be careful, it's a very toxic mindset that just negatively impacts you without your concern for your own well-being. And your priority should be yourself. If you can make sure that you're pursuing things in the direction you want and you're slowly getting there, then do what is within your power or your ability to get there uh, within reason. Artists, for example, have a very, very hard time really removing themselves from, from that and are willing to sacrifice their well-being, their health, to meet other people's expectations or meet their own perceived perception of expectations. And that is very, very dangerous. Uh, but it, I, it might mainly also be because it's a common like personality trait among artists, I think. Uh, so I don't know. That's just something I guess we have to deal with. All right. And do you guys see here that this is like a really, once these are in world space, look, I can pose the shoulders however I want without them being impacted. Like this is why you want spaces, right? Like if you do a pass on the shoulders later, then it's like you do them without impacting all the other stuff. So that is very, very useful. The only reason why I also say this, I can understand people who are younger too. Um, I can only say this now a little bit more because I've been working for a while. And as much as I understand <laughs> that it's like, you really want a job, you really want to do all this stuff. Like I was speaking with my friends a little bit. I think most people who are very interested in getting their first job, once they get into the industry and they start working, a lot of times we think that our jobs or our first jobs are going to be our life defining moment. I was raised in such a way where like I needed to find a profession that would really fulfill me. and. Granted, I am doing something that I appreciate a lot and I want to put more time into and, and like, and I love. But at the same time, I do have to admit that it's also important to remember there's so much else outside of work that it will make you happy or should make you happy or that will balance your life out. It's a common like tech industry bachelorette kind of bachelor bachelorette kind of mentality. Just be like, oh, once I get my job, I'll do blah, blah, blah. And I, beginning two, three years at Riot, I kind of just lived at the office because it was fun and they had stuff like food and everything there and I didn't have to go home. But then I left everything else in my life like in shambles. And now that I have my like career sort of at a point where it's like somewhat sustainable and like I'm pretty happy with it, everything else in my life is completely messed up, right? 
So just think about it like your priority should be maybe to like focus on animation and increasing your skills, but you're in a big bucket of other people who are students who are also uh, students and people who are, you know, starting out or just trying to get better that are learning to work on their craft where it's like, that's important, but don't forget the other stuff. Right. And that's something that you can think about where it's like, I have other things in my life that I need to do and take care of like family and friends and all that stuff that will, you know, balance out all the others, all the other crappy stuff. Cause my life before was like, if I was at work and I was in a bad mood, because I only had work, if I was in a bad mood at work, then my mood at home was like crappy. Ah, but it's interesting. Yeah, no scope. <laughs> I was animating on a Sunday. This animation I view as less work. It's more fun. The streaming part and just talking about stuff and just like taking it easy is like, it's just, it, here's the thing too. Um, I can't talk too much more longer because I have to switch to Clash, but there is a big difference with like animating on your own time and just no stress, no, no, whatever, no like deadlines and no restrictions versus doing it for work or doing it for homework or like class or assignments. I think it's pretty important to just remember that. And there's a big balance, right? There's a very, very big balance of, yeah, I, I'm doing this because I'm like, I need to do something different and I still find animating fun. I just want to do something that's enjoyable for me. And anyway, in again, I think in the end, everyone is different. So some people may need more more other things to keep themselves happy and other people don't we if if all of you are people who are like interested in doing more art or games or stuff for a living i'm assuming most of you are very interested in pursuing something that like makes you happy or brings you joy or brings you excitement when you're working it is interesting to note though that i have a lot of friends that aren't in art a lot of friends that don't necessarily view their job as like creatively fulfilling or just like something that brings them a source of satisfaction every day, day in, day out. I'm fortunate enough to be able to view it that way in many cases, but like a lot of people don't and it's a job. So they go to work, they do their thing, they come back and they have lots of other things in, in their life that bring them fulfillment. Right. And I think we can learn a little bit from that where it's like, maybe maybe we we suffer from the fact that like oh we have we want to do something that we can dedicate our lives to because it brings meaning but i think life is so multifaceted that there's just so many other aspects that combine together to to paint your picture right we are playing fadgets Badoom. all right sorry this is going to be the end of the animation stream we didn't get too much done but i think we talked about a couple interesting like technical things technical challenges and stuff which I found kind of valuable. So I hope that was helpful in some ways. So thanks for dropping by and I will see everyone next week.